Are we ready? Dreams are meant to be bold. They're meant to be daring. But above all, and if nothing else, they're meant to be big. Now this is something that Sierra Breeze knows how to do really, really well. You guys have dreamed very big. While your competitors have stayed in the traditional markets of Asia, Europe, North America, you've set your sights on an uncharted territory, this being South Africa. Now unfortunately though, however, you find yourself in a situation today. Despite your big dreams, you faced a lot of problems in South Africa. A complex distribution system that you don't really know, as well as a foreign market that's for relatively most part unknown to you as well. And this is what's caused you not to gain the success that you thought you would gain in South Africa. But we hope that we can shed some light on that today. Now my name is Curtis, I'm here with Tiffany, I'm also here with Nishan. We are Just In Time Consulting, and we're honored to be here today, just in the nick of time, to help your company achieve its future success in South Africa. Hopefully we can shed some light on this. So the focus of our presentation today is going to be, is, this, is there a supply chain strategy that makes Sierra Breeze profitable in South Africa, it's currently operating in? We're going to look at your retail channels, we'll look at your third party distributors, we're also going to look at brand awareness, because we understand that these are the three main components right now that are limiting your supply chain strategy in South Africa. And we're going to do this through a recommendation that's three parts, understanding the palette, choosing the glass, and taking the next shot. All of this to achieve the $4 million in revenues in South Africa that you were hoping to attain within the next three years. So let's dive into it. First of all, let's look at the uncharted territory that I spoke about. Let's look, talk about South Africa. It's one of the fastest growing economies in Africa, which is why you pinpointed this as your foothold in the continent. So the liquor industry in South Africa right now is valued at $3.6 billion, and this is according to the manufacturers, so this being you, and after all the cuts are taken from the end channel uh, retail distributor. Now we know that you have two main products that you're selling in this market right now, that being spirits, your main product back in America, as well as wine, something that you've developed specifically for this market with the joint partnership. We noticed though with spirits, they haven't been getting the traction that you really wanted to get in South Africa. So throughout the presentation, we're kind of going to delve into why. With wine, it's actually achieved success and maybe you haven't even anticipated. There's a high volume of growth in the wine sales in South Africa. And we're also going to talk about this as we continue on. So first of all, the main question we have to address before we even go further in the presentation, otherwise there would be no point, is, is it actually feasible to stay in South Africa or not? And I bet this is on a lot of your minds. So let's tackle it right now. So should you stay or should you exit? We have a bunch of alternatives. So the first two being staying with the status quo, your current strategy, what's currently happening in South Africa. We say that the potential profit for this is actually just mediocre because you're not really attaining what you thought you would get in South Africa. You wanted the four million, you're not getting it through this current strategy. Now if you exit, you can cut your losses and in the short run, that's fine. You just won't be able to capitalize on this market potential that you've identified. So what we propose today is actually a third kind of alternative. And this is entering South Africa, but we're going to do it through a focused penetration strategy. And we're going to dive into that later on and what that really means for you. Um, here on the left, we've forecasted what the growth is for South Africa, actually, just to make sure that it is financially feasible. And this is a target worth attaining. We're happy to talk through the numbers with you after in the Q&A period, but we just like to say the assumptions we use is a tapered growth rate, as well as if the market was equally distributed across all the service and retail outlets. So let's go into all of the strategy components that's kind of limiting you right now, starting with the retail channels. So we know that in South Africa, there's actually two main ways that you get your product out to consumers. One is the informal, informal channels. So let's talk about what that really means. So one, wholesalers, that's an option. Just like what you and I know as Costco, things like that, we sell high volume discount goods in South Africa. And when you look at the neighborhood stores, these are more the mom and pop shops. They have a more uh, relationship with their clients, emotional relationship. That's really good for them to talk about the products that you're offering and really encourage the clients to try a new thing. When we look at specialized retailers, those are the ones that are really knowledgeable and experienced in liquor. So they really, really know the kind of science behind that and the different tastes and flavors that you get from it. They would be really good on selling your product as well. Let's also look at the beverage service trade. So this is the second option, the second kind of path you take when you look at retail channels. Now, beverage service trade, what do we mean by that? We mainly mean nightclubs, bars and lounges, restaurants. These are frequently opted by foreign tourists. This is a place where it's a really great opportunity to market your brand. Because we noticed that in South Africa, a lot of the trends, especially in popular liquor, starts in these beverage service trade areas, these distribution channels. 
But what main, one of the main questions we're going to talk about today when we go into recommendation is what is the most appropriate channel for you to offer your products, being spirits and wines? And does that differ between the two or should it be the same? Now, secondly, we're going to move on to the third party distributors. When we talk about third party distributors, the one you currently have is Galerian Services. We know that you've recently switched to a different distributor. We're just going to outline the three main issues that you're currently you're experiencing with this distributor that you have. So, one is the misuse of resources. You've invested in sales consultants, and your intention was that they were going to sell your products. But what's happening right now is actually you're selling Galerian's wide range of products, and that could even be products of your competitors. Now, this is something that you don't really want because this is what's personal money that you've invested into this company. Another one is channel coverage. They don't have relations with the bulk market, like the wholesalers. Now, this means that your surveyor of these products, they don't have the opportunity to be present in these channels. And we're gonna also dive in later on whether or not this is actually a big impact on your supply chain strategy. And then lastly, performance issues. You've noted through audit that they have difficulty keeping up with the demand of popular locations. Out of the 100 stores you audited, you found that 20 have frequent stockouts. So we're going to look into the second question, which is which third-party distributor can really provide you with the optimal accessibility to the South African market that you need to succeed. Now lastly, we'll look at brand awareness. So brand awareness in America, perfect. You have locally produced advantage, which means in the, at least in the west coast of the USA, a lot of consumers really appreciate the fact that your suppliers are local, you make it there. But also this comes with that your product has a high-end reception. So People know that Sierra Breeze is a high-end liquor. They're willing to pay the price premium for that. Well, let's look at what's happening in South Africa. South Af Africa, you came in, you're a foreign brand. You didn't really have any clout. You didn't have any uh, really position there to market yourself as a high-end premium brand. Therefore, we don't really consumers don't know why they're paying a premium price point for your product, whether it is premium or not. And to add to the confusion, we noticed that you have an omni-channel strategy. You kind of went into South Africa trying to get in everywhere and anywhere that would take your product. Now the difficulty with doing this, especially in supply chain strategy sense, is that when you're at a wholesaler, your products are there, your products are at a high-end bar. Someone can buy them in both places, so you get confused on really what is your position for your product. So we're going to look at how can you grow the brand in South Africa so it can be internationally recognized. Moving into this focused penetration strategy, we have to answer a couple of questions. So we have this overarching strategy of sustaining the Sierra strategy. And what this really means is answering these questions for you today. So what are the most appropriate channels for Sierra Visa's product? What, what third-party distributors can provide the optimal accessibility to the South African market that you are operating in today? And how can you grow as a brand in this country? So moving on to the first recommendation, which is understanding the palette. We believe that you can distribute your spirits and sparkling wines through targeted channels instead of targeting, uh, instead of all through every channel possible. So, this means that we believe you can distribute your spirits through specialized retail and international bars and lounges. In these areas, there are service service workers that can help promote your products, which is what uh, these high um, growth, gross margin products really needs to be able to sell. Your wines, on the other hand, is high volume, but also have a low, lower gross margin. And these can actually be distributed through open, whole, uh, open market wholesales instead. And these, in this way, you can focus on generating high volume for wines, and, but also have a more accurate targeting of your high-end consumers through these service lounges and restaurants. It's also an opportunity to market your brand to tourists, especially because they frequent these bars and lounges so often. This is with a goal to reduce your stockouts, your holding costs, and your returns because of the unfocused and unnecessary um, distribution in, through these channels that are not what the, the products actually need. So the benefit of this is an 8% growth rate in revenue, which translates to $184,000 per year, and a 2% decrease in cost, which will translate to $223,000 per year. And the assumption is that revenue will grow along with the market, and that 2% of costs are caused by these uh, stockouts, holding costs, and returns, and that the gross profit is currently at $269,000, and that there's net sales of $2.3 million. So the next one is that now you know and identify the needs of your products, which, distribution which distributors can actually provide 
uh, what you actually want for your products. So we believe that you can begin a closed RFP with the top five distributors in Africa for both your SKB wines and all, also your Sierra Spirits and put them separate. So we know that you have your consultants and we really want to use them because they're being underutilized right now. And we believe they can use, uh, we, you, we can use them to conduct due diligence to make sure that they actually will be doing, uh, the distributors will be actually selling the products that you want them to sell. Uh, there's also be competitive pricing due to the close RFP. And both SPV, we also emphasize that both SPV Wise and Sierra Spheres have dis different distribution requirements that I'll dive deeper into later. And that there should be different distributors for the two of them. So our goal for this is to align your distributor characteristics with Sierra's capabilities with a goal of reaching the cap uh, of hitting KPIs of uh, delivered in full and on time, uh, lower lead times, and also higher service levels. So choosing your, um, your distributors, we have to look at some criteria. So for both your Sierra Spirits and also your wines, you want to make sure your distributors have compliance and good pricing. But more specifically for the Sierra Spirits, you want to make sure they have expertise and coverage of service locations, specifically bars and lounges. And for SVB uh, wines, to have expert expertise and coverage of retail locations. Now, changing a distribution network is an incredibly complex task. However, we've laid out the implementation plan, which is split into three different parts that uh, spans from planning, execution, and monitoring, to break it down and walk you through exactly how you're going to make this complex change. Looking at the planning phase, the first goal of this is to sign a contract with your chosen distributor following the RFP process. And this is very similar to the process you've already gone through when switching distributors, except now there's going to be an increased focus on the subcontractors, the, the, co the customers that these contractors are servicing, as well as compliance, which has been uh, a, a pain point of, for you in the past. Third part of, uh, the third step of this planning phase is going to be to educate our, the distributor on your products, as well as the customers and the needs that a customer, and how to uh, communicate those products to your customers so that they understand the value of Sierra wines. Now we've estimated that this will have a $30,000 cost, primarily because you're going to be moving resources away from existing activities. Moving on to the execution phase, um, the goal of this is really to have a smooth transition over to your new distributor. So this starts with communicating the change to your retail and service partners so that they understand that there's going to be a change in how these products are reaching the end consumer. Uh, this phase transition is going to take place uh, dependent on geography, so as to minimize the actual disruptions to your customers as well as your, and re, uh, your dis retail uh, outlets which are selling these products for you. Finally, uh, this, this, uh, this phase is going to end with a full transition to your new distribution partners that have been chosen throughout this process. And we do estimate that this, there will be quite an extensive cost uh, both from your own manpower and energy, as well as due to uh, any materials related to communicating these changes. And we estimated this to be $100,000. Moving on to the monitoring phase, the goal of this is to evaluate whether there has been a successful transition to these new distributors. The first step of this will be to collect feedback from your new distributors to make sure that they're achieving the goals that we've set, that you've set out to achieve. Second aspect of this will be monitoring the changes in the KPIs that we had outlined earlier, such as uh, your delivered in full on time percentages and volumes, as well as the revenue that we're generating uh, because of this change. Finally, we're going to have to continuously audit compliance because this has been such a big pain point, and we understand that the industry faces this challenge continuously. Again, we estimate that there will be a cost of $50,000 because there's going to be energy and time uh, reallocated from existing activities. So we believe that your products are selling really well right now. Your spirits and wines have a total uh, revenue of around $2 million, but we believe you can go even bigger. We believe you can dream even bigger. So we believe you can take it to the next level by finding South Africa's own Napa Valley. And what we mean by this is creating new spirits and wines that suit the local taste and preferences of South Africa. And this is a way to appeal to local customers and also a way to push your uh, vision to actually uh, be able to provide 15% of your profits to your non your, the nonprofit organizations 
that you are so proud to be partnered with. And the goal of this is to create a profitable product that suits the localized taste of your South African consumers, like I said before, and it will increase your revenues by 15% a year, uh, which will approximately equal to $340,000. And our <coughs> is that these revenues will go along with the market and that the gross profit margin will be higher than spirits because there's lower transportation costs and also because of the local production of farmers that is lower cost than Napa Valley. And now that we've presented you this exciting new uh, idea for Sierra, we would like to walk you through exactly how you can implement it. First, we're going to have to identify your local supply chain. So that means an expedition into the, into the southern region of South Africa, close to Cape Town, where, which we know is the agricultural hub. And, uh, and we really want your staff from Napa Valley to go out into the farmers and try out the wines, see what grapes are available, and see the soil quality before choosing a wine producer, that, uh, a grape producer that you can partner with. Uh, second aspect would be evaluation of production infrastructure. So where are you going to be producing uh, your actual production facilities? Is that going to be on a whip vineyard? Or are you going to move that away, maybe closer to towards your Johannesburg, where a lot of uh, manufacturing takes place in South Africa? Third aspect of this is assessment of logistics providers. So how are we actually going to get those produced wines over to our retail partners, as well as our distri distributors? And of course, this is going to be quite an extensive process. And we've assigned it a $200,000 uh, cost, especially when we are bringing over resources from uh, the operations in the U.S. Looking over the execution, uh, the goal of this is, of course, to pre-game production of the localized Sierra products. But however, before these wines can hit the shelves, we want to come back to the main mission of Sierra, and that is partnering with uh, non-profit organizations. And so uh, an important step will be to assess local charities that you would like to partner up with within uh, South Africa and make sure that the, the, your goals are, are aligned to the geography that you're now operating in. Second aspect of this is a slow phase up in production. Um, and finally, a full rollout and marketing uh, brochure ca tasting campaign, which also plays into the, uh, into the localized nature of the product offering that we're giving so that you can continuously improve and, and uh, alter the taste of your wines for the South African market. Again, we have assigned this quite an extensive cost, $150,000, and we'll be diving into those soon. Uh, in terms, and then finally, in the monitoring phase, we have to assess the success of these products. So the first step of this will be to collect feedback from your customers and other stakeholders within uh, this new supply chain that you've created. Um, and finally, also consider bringing these African products over back to the USA and, and trialing them in uh, your home ground. In terms of implementation timeline, we, as, we expect our first two recommendations to be completed within the first year because they are such urgent needs that would need to be addressed. Whereas taking the next shot, you know, uh, bringing our localized product to the market, we understand will take a much longer uh, time period. And uh, we expect that to uh, either take up to five quarters and uh, we fully expect it to possibly take even more. So we recommended you with three main recommendations today, which is to find the needs that your products actually need, choose the right distributors, and also to create a new product that can suit the needs of the, uh, suit the demands of the South American consumers. And but we understand that recommendations come with risks. And one of the ones that we have identified is that there's still going to be non-compliance with your distributors. And a mitigation of this is to continue to use your um, consulting uh, consultants to conduct random audits to ensure compliance, but we believe by creating a penalty system to potentially uh, incentivize compliance will also be a good contingency. Uh, another one, another risk is that new products do not suit customer taste, but we believe that these new products will be the way to grow your presence in the South African market, which is why we want to push it further. And so even though marketing research that is conducted to test products might not be, uh, might not, might not help suit customer taste, but we believe that you can continuously adapt these flavors until it suits their taste to make sure the product will be successful. So overall, our sustaining Sierra strategy. What we would recommend with you today is with the first two steps, really getting to know your market, what your supply chain requirements are, and what it's going to take to serve those South African consumers, the right retail channel with the right distributor. And with our third recommendation, we look to the future, forward-looking at what the next stage looks like this year, reason South Africa to turn its dreams into a reality. 
Thank you. We will now commence with the Q&A, sir. Uh, I just have some clarifying questions. Um, so what we were saying was based on the requirements of what your two separate product, like, product lines of for distribution, you need high volume for the wines, right? So probably wholesale is the way to go. With these spirits, you need more advertising with your retail channel, right? So we were thinking that service room is a better way for it to go. Whichever distributor can provide you with that solution in the most cost efficient way, then that's how the RFC process will work out. And if you need to switch from the radiant, then you should. Okay. And then just a follow up to that. Uh, so you're mentioning that the spirits will be kind of available mainly for the services. Is it only available for the services industry or is it also available for retail? Like if you try to drink, can you like it? Can you still buy the spirit at a store? So what we were going with that route was that yes, you try it in the restaurant, you try it in the bar and the lounge. It's also available in the specialized store. So you won't have it in the wholesale stores because as I said before, that kind of creates a confusion among consumers. Uh, you guys have struggled with uh, uh, these third-party distributors in the past. Uh, you guys thought about self-distribution? Uh, so approaching, uh, approaching the South African market with a direct distribution strategy was something that we had thought about. However, we decided to not go forward with this strategy because of the actually the, the difficulties that were outlined uh, in the information that we uh, were provided. Uh, we realized that I mean, our retail partners, whether that be in the lounges or um, in the supermarkets, uh, often were, were went through the same non-compliance issues, where uh, they quickly, you know, move moved uh, products away from the shelves, uh, away from, uh, you know, behind the bartender bartender's counter, and we felt that these issues would continue to persist unless we continue to use a distributor which has the connections and the relationships with the potential uh, retailers and service providers, and so we felt that a distributor would best suit our needs. So I'm a little bit unclear on your finances. How do you arrive at the costing numbers, and also when do we get a payback on the investment value? For sure. So a lot of these costings were uh, estimated just on our understanding of uh, industry industry best practices. So whether that be the, um, the amount you pay uh, administrative staff for doing things such as uh, collecting uh, data and monitoring for feedback. Um, and as well as if we're looking at the payback period of all the recommendations that we put out, uh, of course we, we uh, did not present it, but we did estimate a two and a half year payback period. We did also run an NPV analysis, which showed that uh, we would uh, be looking at a positive NPV of around $200,000 for this project. We're using very conservative estimates. And in that NPV, how did you break down the growth between the spirits and the wines? So, uh, Thankfully, we were given uh, some information regarding uh, the retail, so the growth rates within retail, as well as the growth rates within the service lines, and we catered the, the spirits to the, we catered the growth of the spirits along with the, the growth of the service lines, as we, and we, we catered the wine, wine revenue growth to that of the retail, and we uh, came to a compounded uh, growth rate from that. And then as far as targeting geographies, so you kind of talked about the north and the south between Cape Town and Johannesburg. So uh, what is the logistics considerations around that? So we understand that um, Cape Town, of course, located right at the south of South Africa, and Johannesburg located closer to the middle, middle regions. Um, we, we are not entirely familiar with what logistics providers there are, but we do understand that South Africa has a thriving agricultural economy, and we understand that the infrastructure to move the products uh, around South Africa is already quite well established, and so we um, we our, our estimations were that the infrastructure is already in place and there would be minimal uh, changes needed to it, and that service providers would be ready. Right Thank you for your presentation.